Hello, and welcome to this session on Oracle Machine Learning Office Hours Machine Learning 102 Clustering uh, with Marcos Arensabia and myself, Mark Hornick. For today's agenda, uh, we'll talk briefly about the upcoming session, uh, then have our uh, main speaker for clustering and Q&A to follow. Also, if you have questions during the session, feel free to add them to the Q&A section of Zoom. The next session is planned for December 3rd, and it will be Machine Learning 101 uh, Feature Extraction. And so this seventh session in the series will cover feature extraction, where we'll learn more about the methods to extract meaningful attributes from a large number of columns and data sets, explore dimensionality reduction, and how it can be beneficial as a pre-processing step for machine learning modeling. For more information on Oracle Machine Learning, uh, go to our website at oracle.com slash machine dash learning. And if you would like to take advantage of the always free services on autonomous database, you can go to oracle.com slash cloud slash free, and you'll be able to work with OML notebooks uh, currently uh, using the OML for SQL interface. So for today's session, we have Machine Learning 102, clustering. And in this, uh, we will study the effects of multiple variables in clustering and learn more about the methods on multiple dimensions, comparing clustering techniques, and explore dimensionality reduction and how to extract only the most meaningful attributes from data sets with a lot of attributes or derived attributes. So with that, I will turn it over to uh, Marcos. Uh, Marcos, take it away. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, and welcome everyone. So what I wanted to do today uh, is to go through the different components that we went the last time. So we talked about k-means, we talked about um, O cluster, we talked about expectation maximization. So this time, instead of using only two columns or two attributes, uh, I wanted to try to use more than two and see what happens, right, for us in terms of uh, visualization. So I'm going to talk about 2D and 3D, but also how the algorithms react, right, to different numbers of attributes. And if you have too many attributes coming in, what happens? Let's start with the k-means, right? That's, again, the, the, the simplest one. So in terms of the k-means, then we're going to take a look at, you know, the data set, again, export the data, um, create a subset of the data, just like we did before. But now we're going to let more attributes come into that data set. And then we're going to tackle the same tasks as before, look at the um, scatter plots and building a basic simple k-means model, right? With k equals two. But then we're going to create a function for building several. And then we're going to look into that um, in not only 2D, but 3D as well. So the data set we're going to use actually is the same. We're going to continue using the on-time data set. Uh, the you know the scheduled and 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 actual departures and arrivals from flights. Um, now the last time we only used um, departure delay and distance, um, I believe. So this time we're gonna uh, actually uh, increase that uh, by adding a couple of variables as well to that uh, data set. So uh, basic initialization of the environment. And then if you look at the data set, right, um, we have a 10,000 record data set itself. If we look at the full data set, these are the columns, right, that we looked at the last time, right? So all these uh, different um, columns that we have here that we have uh, information about all the flights. Now we're gonna subset that data set. So we're gonna select only um, departure delays with less than uh, 40 uh, minutes of, of delay or only the ones that had a maximum of 10 minutes early. Uh, and then the same thing with distance between 200 and 2000 miles, flights not canceled and flights not diverted. And we're gonna focus on Chicago again, the same time, uh, the same thing we did last time, um, we're gonna focus on Chicago. So uh, the last time we also did this, right? We were looking at the data sets, right? And then we looked at uh, arrival delay, but what I'm doing now, right, if I have departure delay and arrival delay, I'll just, you know, just for the sake of it, we can take a look at what happens if I throw in something like day of week. What's the distribution, right? And you can, and you can see that it goes uh, everywhere, right? So you got, basically, if I do the same thing here with matplotlib, 
um, you can see that the day of the week then, it is really a, a quite chaotic attribute, right? Compared to the distance and the departure delay, for example, right? That we were more or less used to, to seeing before. So it is a variable that is not helping as, you, as we can see, right? It's not helping me distinguish between these flights. Um, but that's the idea, right? When, you, when you're trying to, to work with more than two dimensions, you end up with uh, multiple different types of, of uh, dimensions here or, or different types of, of uh, components, right? That when you look at, it might not make sense or might not help you uh, build a great uh, clustering. So at the end of the day, um, what I'm doing here now is I'm looking at the four columns that we chose. So we chose here uh, these four columns, uh, distance, departure delay, arrival delay and day of week, right? And uh, at this point, I'm doing the scatter plot because that's gonna show me uh, the entire set, right? So I can see the distributions between the variables, right? So distance, departure, delay, arrival delay, and day of week, which I expect that to be something like this, right? Because they are, uh, uh, they are basically uh, a, a string, right? Um, and you have seven uh, categories there, seven days of week. So, uh, at the end of the day, again, we want to take a look at what happens when you do that in a in an algorithm, right? So for k-means, for example. So I'm going to build a k-means, uh, just basic, simple things, 20 iterations, uh, random seed. Uh, and the important thing here is k um, equals 2, right? Number of clusters equals 2. So I'm going to give it a name so I can come back to it and, and score with it and, and use it. And then I want to check what happens. So the output of that algorithm, right? So the, the output here, I'm saying cluster is equals two. Uh, there is some tolerance that was the default. Uh, number of iterations was that I changed. The distance is the default. Uh, and then uh, basically what it's saying is it used all the, you know, the four attributes that, that you're confirming that you use the attributes that you passed. And this is what it uh, came back with. So it came back with two segments, two clusters. And you can see, uh, you know, probably more clear on the right-hand side, the clusters built by the algorithm were two clusters. From the 411 original records, it built one cluster with 408 and another cluster with three records, right? So three flights in this case. So uh, let's try to understand why, right? So we then predict, right? We can predict, if you remember, we can predict um, the, the cluster um, assignation, or we can predict the probability as well, right? On the, on the right-hand side, I'm doing the probability. On the left, uh, the prediction. When I do this, the last time I was only calling a supplemental column um, for, I believe, the one right record because we were looking at two columns. Now, if I use uh, diaresis here, um, then... When I use the column here, what, what this guy is going to do is actually bring all of the contents of the original data set plus my prediction, which is what I get here. I get distance, departure, delay. So I want to bring all the columns plus now cluster ID, right? So same thing over here on the right when I do that same supplemental columns, right? But I'm, I'm picking them up from the uh, on-time TMP data set, right? So that guy only has those four columns. Then I bring all of them here, and now I get these two columns, probability of two and probability of three, right? So that probability of belonging to uh, each of the clusters, right? So let's take a look at that and, and visualize them, right? And in two dimensions. So on the left-hand side, I'm going to do a two-dimensional view of that. And um, this is what happens. So you have suddenly a cluster that is showing you that almost everyone is on that cluster. And then there's a second cluster with only three records, right? Only, only three flights. And you see them here. And you're like, it might not make sense, right? So looking at this thing in two dimensions, departure delay and distance does not make sense. But remember, we actually threw four columns or four attributes 
for the algorithm to build. So when looking at the same exact data, but in three dimensions, uh, look at what happens now. So now looking at the arrival delay uh, attribute here, we can see that this is completely separating those three flights from all the rest. So it makes a lot of sense for an algorithm like k-means, right, to pick these three guys apart. Because remember that we discussed this the last time, the k-means algorithms are trying to, to, to see distances. And I'm trying to look at equidistances from centroid. So if a centroid is here, probably the centroid of the, of the entire um, cloud down here, right, is over here. And this thing's uh, keep that distance, right? So he's trying to create that distance for you, right? So that is critical then that we understand that when we use multiple attributes and we everything we do in multiple dimensions, uh, you might end up having that kind of uh, difference, right? And capabilities. Now, remember also that because we created the, uh, the model, right? And up here, we gave the model a name. So when we were building the model, we gave the model a specific name. That actually triggers uh, the storage of the model for later usage by SQL. So right now I jump into SQL and I, for example, can check what are the most important attributes that makes uh, a customer or an, a flight in this case be assigned to cluster number one or two, or in this case, the cluster number zero or one or whatever we are, we're doing here. I think it's two and three. The, the official number here is gonna be two and three, the cluster ID, right? So uh, when we look into that then down here, I can do that query. I can select a few IDs just to check for every single customer that I have here. Um, and I am, I am now scoring a new data set. This is the, uh, the entire table, a 10,000 record table that I'm scoring, but I'm selecting a few uh, customers. And now I can check what is the attribute that is the most important attribute in determining the reason why uh, that record was scored as cluster ID2. So uh, as you can see, it's mostly going to be arrival delay. You don't even need a second attribute just because the K equals two, the way that it, it showed us, right? That really the only attribute it's taking into account is pretty much arrival delay, right? Based on the arrival delay, I can slice this a plane through this and I can immediately see the difference between those. So uh, moving on, um, for uh, trying to understand the best, the, the best number of clusters, right? So trying to estimate the best number of clusters, uh, the elbow method is kind of like an old one. Um, so there are more modern methods used uh, like silhouette or gap statistic, but uh, this is a, a very easy to, to understand. So I put the, the link here for uh, Wikipedia if you wanna check that. But what we're doing here on the left then is we're building uh, several um, k-means algorithms, right? K-mean models from k equals two to, to whatever x you pass me uh, in the parameter. So a very simple function. What we're doing is we are creating a, an empty pandas data frame to store the within sum of squares, right? Uh, the total within sum of squares, we are uh, creating a basic setting and then we're running from, from that range, right? From the two to the number you're giving me, right? Plus one, because, because of the indexing in, in, in Python, you need that plus one. And then uh, on the k-means model, we're gonna build a k-means model with that number of clusters you're giving me. And we're gonna capture the, uh, the, the score, which, is, which gives me the total within sum of squares. And then we're gonna add it to that list and append it to, to the list. So then I'm plotting exactly that. So on the right-hand side here, I have the elbow plot from k equals two to k equals 10 from a table uh, that I'm passing uh, directly to it. So what I get here down there is that the idea on the elbow 
plot is that you can check the total within sum of squares. And at some point, it's called the elbow because you're looking at like, you know, you're looking at your arm and then where is the elbow? At what point it stops smoothly coming down, right? And it starts going to, to more, more horizontal, right? So exactly in this point with K equals five, it is showing that by the elbow method, uh, that would be your ideal number of clusters, okay? So for creating then a function for building, scoring, and plotting k-means, right? I, we did that before in the last uh, uh, lessons. And what we did then was we were doing a 2D plot. Uh, in this case, I wanted to do that 3D plot. So um, because we saw already that there is a difference, right? for us just to visualize that. So we added a 3D plot here. Uh, and then for each cluster, I'm going to be plotting um, that, uh, that kind of, of uh, difference there for us. So in this case, um, we're gonna go from K equals two to K equals seven. So for K equals two, I give it, you know, the, the, the K here, I pass it, the data set that I'm using. And uh, because I want to be able to, to, to twist around, right? Remember that when we look at 3D, there might be a better angle to view the data from. So I, I'm passing, you know, the option of rotating that uh, in an axis, whether, you know, that, that might help. So first things first, on K equals two, it's the same thing we, see, we saw before, right? I rotated it a little bit so that we can see it even better. Uh, that that is an easy uh, easy way to differentiate uh, between um, those two segments. For uh, k equals three, um, it is not obvious. Remember again, the k means tries hard to create clusters that have the same size, right? Mostly, so uh, not the same size, but the same distance, right? So because of that. It, this might not be very obvious, right? That the, the split here, uh, you might say, you know, this guy could have been from that cluster. Uh, this these people here could have been from this cluster, right? So it's not that obvious. There is a the, the three records on the top, right? The three flights on the top continue to be separated by themselves there for sure. We k equals four. This is really kind of like confusing. You start seeing some some other levels here. So maybe these are like upper and lower. So you you, you know we would have needed probably a different um, could use a different angle here to try to to see these other from the other side. But that that's basically what you start uh, looking at. And the k equals five, which actually originally shown to be one of the best at least four k means right. Um, I can see that at least, you know, four, <clears throat> the fifth, between the fourth and the fifth is, is kind of harder to, to separate that angle. Now, you got to remember as well that we also have a, another variable here. So these, the model was built not only using these three variables, right? The model was built using the fourth variable. There's day of week as well added into this mix. So... Uh, we cannot see four dimensions, right? And that's that's na a natural, uh, a normal limitation of human beings. But the idea here is then we are looking at this from different faces just to look at um, what the model could have been doing. But we're paying attention to the total within sum of squares in the case of k-means to so try to understand what's the best the k-means algorithm can do. Okay, and then for six and seven, uh, it looks a little more confusing and, and a little harder for uh, the k-means to uh, to work with. Okay, now that is for uh, k-means. Of course, uh, continuing on, uh, I am going to work be working on on some other scripts uh, for uh, silhouette. Um, and I'm going to check if I can do one for a gap statistic that I can put that together with these things on GitHub for you guys so that you can um, be able to take advantage of it and, and you know, uh, play with it and, and use it, right? So let's take a look at O cluster. 
So the last time we were um, talking about our cluster, we talked about it on on our uh, slides, but we did not show it in in the code. And and today we're going to take a look at this. So basically, again, the same data set we're going to use with it, the same initialization and the same data. But now uh, there is a difference for our cluster, and and that is right now we we don't have yet a Python interface for our cluster. Uh, so maybe that will come later on. But right now, for running old cluster, you need to run the SQL, um, a PL SQL code. So the good thing with this is OML for Pi in Autonomous uh, is 100% compatible with the SQL in Autonomous. So we're going to see how to use both, right? So right here, I am, again, checking just the entire data set and, and checking that that on the right. But also on the top here, I'm going to build my uh, my sub sample, right? My sample data set. Remember, we just did that for k means, right? So we went with distance, departure, delay, arrival, delay of day of week, and with all the filters here. So what I need to do for my O cluster is I need that database which is actually right now is just a view and it's a proxy object in OML for Pi. I need to convert and write that guy to a database table that I can use with O cluster. So now it's as simple as uh, the following. So what I'm doing is I'm dropping, if there is a table in the database that is called that, uh, this guy is going to drop that table. and I am going to take that new view that I just created here, right? With all these features, that long query there. And that view, I'm going to materialize it into a table in the database called on time TMP. So now uh, I, I have here on the left, the OML for Pi proxy object called on time TMP, but I'm also writing the table, physical table to Oracle database called on time TMP. So I can use the same exact table here. So for example, on the left hand side, I'm using select star from on time TMP. And it's the same thing we had, right? So if I take my day of week, I'm going to get the exact same result as before. That this is now uh, using SQL, right, for that table. And on the right-hand side, I can use the on-time TMP proxy object, right? And pull it into memory to play with uh, the charts. So uh, for cl creating then the, the clustering here, so for all cluster, notice that I'm gonna use SQL. So using SQL, I'm gonna do PL SQL here. I'm going to drop the model, right? OC plus model. And then I'm going to build the O cluster model using uh, on the SQL side using what we know as uh, create model two. So in this case, I'm leaving the auto data preparation right, the prep auto on uh, algorithm name. So this is the specific OML algorithm name that needs to be listed like that. And then number of clusters, I'm giving you, I'm giving it five just to see whether you know whatever it can do. And I'm giving it the uh, sensitivity, uh, specific sensitivity. It can this this guy will go from zero to one. You can play with the number, uh, but basically, at this point, it's building the model, and then as an input to the model, I'm going to select that data set. So select star from that. So I'm selecting all the columns, the four columns, right, that I have from that TMP file. So then you build the model and the model is going to be created. And this is the name of that model. So the OC class model is now a model created uh, for me in the database. So I can check the settings of that model. Again, I'm still doing SQL. So checking the settings of that model. So when model name is that, uh, you can check the user mining model settings. And uh, here we go. So we can see number of clusters requested, right? 
So be built for five, there's a sensitivity, uh, enable um, uh, missing value um, automations here, uh, sampling disable, right? Things like that, prep out or on, and that's fine. And then on the right-hand side, we can check what are the attributes that were used, right? So attribute name, basically these were the uh, attributes that were used to build uh, my model. Um, so every model, when we store the Oracle machine learning models, they create uh, something called these model views. And they are very useful. Uh, and, and most of them will contain information that if you are using the OML for Pi uh, interfaces, that you might not even notice because you might not really need uh, it. It's all automated for you. But in this case, you got to know where to find the things that you're looking for. So uh, in this case, when you do that query, that SQL code here, uh, we can see what is the view type uh, specifically that's going to help us identify what is each of these views, what are they, they doing, uh, and what do they have in terms of our model requirement? So on the right-hand side then, we're looking at the VD, the cluster description view type. So we are selecting cluster record count and parent just to check what were the clusters that the O cluster was able to find. And in this case, uh, even though I, I had requested five, right? the O cluster struggled and, and trying to find more than two, and it actually found two. So it, it basically found two separate clusters here for me. And this is just because, again, if I change that setting that I was talking about before, when you change sensitivity, it might, it might change a little bit, but in this very small data set that I'm playing with, um, the structure uh, does not really uh, have more than those two clusters that the O cluster was able to find. So the O cluster, then I can check things like the uh, clustering attribute statistics, right? The, the VA view, which is this one. So it tells me basically the, the attributes and their you know, mean and, and, and variables of values that were, were, were used. And then um, this is the count. And then for example, I can do the, the scoring. So I can do uh, a scoring via SQL. So for example, I'm dropping a table called OC plus scoring, and then I'm running a new scoring. So at this point I'm doing uh, basically a cluster ID out of that OC plus model, right? S cluster ID. And then I'm selecting these other columns from that same table and I'm creating a table. Right, I'm creating a new table there. So when I create that table, which is probably wrong, this 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 name should have been that. Um, it's just a, a detail here. Uh, so when I create that table, then see that I'm in SQL here, right? So from Python, then I can pull that scoring in using OML sync, for example. If I wanted to check the table right, the data itself, I can easily do OML sync, table equals that table that I just created using PL, uh, using SQL here. And then I can bring that the results to my screen. I also could have done just select star from that using SQL and the results gonna be the same as this thing, okay? So you can see that, that, uh, that, uh, that result. So, Given that, right? Given that I now have that OC scored, then I can plot, right? I can do the same thing. I can then plot them in two dimensions and in three dimensions. And now you can see that even though I have three dimensions or four dimensions actually when I got in, the uh, O cluster actually preferred to slice the data uh, in this manner, right? So for our cluster, it made more sense to separate these guys uh, in this way than trying to isolate these three little guys there because those three little guys might have been just an exception for these guys, but they are still behaving similarly. So 
specifically for the orthogonal partitioning capabilities of oak cluster, then it is finding patterns that are more in line with what we saw before when we were actually only checking uh, distance and departure delay, if you remember, when we were only checking those two guys, even k-means with those two dimensions were actually splitting it up over here. Uh, so the uh, orthogonal partitioning is actually saying, you know what, when I try to isolate this thing, this does not look like a pattern that I can split and say, this is completely separate from that. Uh, it actually prefers to split and find things that are bigger. And that ha also has to do with the sensitivity that I put there. Remember that I added sensitivity 0 0.9 when I was building the model. So all of these things are uh, things that will, you know, let you uh, check and, 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 and have that, that kind of vision, right? And, and understand what's happening. So the same thing, uh, again, because we have those user model views, um, remembering that the same kind of capability, right? So you can check this, uh, this out and make sure that you can see all of the, your, you know, your views there, right? Now, uh, I am gonna be building something that will let you test with several K as well for the O cluster, but that involves uh, SQL and PL SQL so I'll, I will add that code uh, later on when I pu publish this to, um, to uh, uh, our uh, GitHub, okay? So finally, uh, if I go to my um, expectation maximization, this is probably one of the most uh, interesting ones because it is uh, the most advanced of the algorithms here. Uh, it is, uh, it, it does have, uh, if you remember, the searching capability. So you can search several models uh, to find the best model, to find the best number of clusters and all that, right? In, in an automated fashion. So again, we're gonna check uh, our uh, data set, the same data set we were using before. Um, we're gonna use that same filtering. Uh, this time, this guy stays as uh, an OML for Pi just proxy, right? So a prox in Python, it's just a proxy. Uh, so a view to that data set and that query. Same thing applies again. So it's the same data set, same, same uh, processes, same things. I, I can just visualize uh, as well, right? Using uh, the day of the week and the day of the week here on the right. So th the data is the same. Uh, now we're gonna do model build. So I can change and play with a number of iterations and the uh, thresholds, right? Th those are things that we can play and we we're gonna see how that works um, uh, down below. But just as that default setting, uh, and then I can pr do the predictions here on the right-hand side so I can get my, my cluster ID predicted, um, then the, the result of that model, right? Is saying, uh, because I, I did not, I did not tell it how many clusters I wanted to use. Then the default is 10. But again, remember that expectation maximization, the number of clusters is actually the maximum number of clusters, okay? So it is going to uh, search for the ideal number of clusters, right? So 10 is like your maximum. Um, so uh, it, it's got a default number of components uh, and then it's gonna, compute some settings and evaluate this thing. And at the end, uh, it shows us, We I think we have here the statistics of the clusters. One, two, three, four, five. There you go. So cluster counts. So it actually identified the 10 for us in, in this case, okay? And uh, another cool thing that expectation maximization gives us and the other um, algorithms do not, is an attribute importance. So directly, this guy can say, okay, this is the most important variable um, uh, to determine um, the um, cluster. And then the second one uh, is here, right? Rank number two is departure delay. Rank number three is distance. And then at the last or least used here is day of week, right? 
but it's still using all of them. So in, a, in an ideal world, when you're building these uh, kinds of processes, and we're going to see uh, much more of this uh, in the next session with feature extraction, but in an ideal world, you would select uh, the best attributes to use and not use all of them at once. Um, using many, many attributes is just going to get more and more confusing. And if you're trying to do segmentation and clustering, uh, you might end up uh, either with a, with a very, very, very specific clustering um, that might not be very useful for, for example, uh, business, right? So if you have a business case where you need, uh, you know, you're building clusters, you might end up with like, okay, yeah, I need, you know, five clusters, right? I need 10 clusters for technical purposes. So if you have someone calling in or you got to segment your customer list and then you need different tactics to work on these customers, typically the fastest way is having a small number of these, these clusters that are actually going to be used by the entire company, right? And then behind the scenes, you might have a larger number of clusters that are more strategic, but then the company uh, or the team on marketing department is looking at, or the sales team is looking at. But when you talk about it, you might have a smaller number, right? So think about, you know, silver, platinum, gold, right? Those kind of things when you think about financial services. Uh, those are simple ways of describing a person, right? Uh, and, and that's kind of the same thing here. So when you're building clusters to use it in real life, normally you try to reduce the number of that uh, to a point where this is easy to understand. So if, you, if I call you and I say, there's a platinum customer calling on the phone, you know what kind of customer that is immediately, right? Versus if I say, hey, there's a guy from cluster number 135 calling, that doesn't mean anything, right? So it... It's confusing, it's super difficult to even find what that means. So normally when you work with clustering in real life, you are trying to reduce the, the number of clusters and the attributes, right? The number of attributes you're using is gonna be very helpful as well to try to then characterize those clusters for you. So on the right-hand side, then we see the prediction. Again, the same uh, process, we are bringing all the, all the columns plus the uh, cluster ID, right? And then looking at the attribute importance, right? So again, uh, just as we saw before, but this time, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing them in and I'm sorting that by, by the attribute importance itself, right? And, and showing that uh, over here. And I think that's, that's gonna be, again, important and critical for you guys to, to pay attention to, right? Uh, the same process as before, now you can see that instead of just paying attention to one attribute, right? Um, then this guy is going to pay attention to several attributes. And, and for one customer in particular, for example, the first attribute or the most important attribute was day of week and then departure delay and then arrival delay, right? So these are the reasons why this customer was assigned cluster 18 with a very high probability. Now, uh, these, again, if we switch a different customer, then... Uh, this guy is 100% based on just day of week, for example, right? So those things will change for every uh, every customer you might have. You might have a separate and a different type of attributes that are important for them, right? Specifically for that customer. So we're going to build a, a function, just like the last time, for uh, building, uh, scoring uh, the the model. Uh, we're going to capture the log likelihood uh, of that expectation maximization. Um, and then we're going to, um, in this case, again, because we want to take a look at the 3D, right? So we're going to build a 3D plot for it. Now, remember, expectation maximization clusters, uh, these are different, right? The model. So I am allowing you to enter whatever settings you want in my function. So on the left-hand side, I have nothing, everything default. All, all, I'm giving you the data set, default, so nothing, and just the angle I want to see it. On the right-hand side, I want to give you a lower threshold setting. 
this guy is going to let the um, enter the expectation maximization algorithm look for more details on the cluster. So it's going to probably let it look for deeper number of clusters, right? A larger number of clusters. So, uh, but at the end of the day, they came out similar. And if you look at what's going on then, right? You can see here, I did not say anything. So if I don't say anything, the N, uh, the number of clusters is 10. Expectation maximization then identified eight clusters as the ideal. But it's kind of confusing. If you look at these clusters, they don't really look very um, well separated, right? Or very well identified, you would say. So the same thing would happen here with, uh, you know, if you lower that threshold, uh, it, it looks a little different, uh, the design. So it's trying to group better, but it's still not, not perfect. So now we start with model search. So if you leave the model search enable option, um, I'm going to test it on the left with that and on the right with model search enabled and also a lower threshold as well. So let's take a look at what, what, what happens then. So now with model search enabled, uh, the expectation maximization by default with all defaults is actually telling us, you know what? It's probably the best we can do is three clusters. And that's what it's finding out. So it itself, it identified three clusters with the model search enable. Now this will take more time. The model search enable will execute the process and look for the best number of models for you. So it will take more time than, than the just plain old uh, without it, right? With, this, with it disabled. But what I'm saying here is it might be a good practice for you to, if, you, if you, you're not having, you know, uh, if it's not taking a, the longest time for you, right? Because these algorithm can take time depending on the, the, the data set size, right? But if you have that time, uh, once you are ready to run, I would go back here and then enable search because this guy will then find the best patterns for you and, and will return a better uh, model. On the right-hand side here, I enabled the search, but I also reduced the default from two to one here on the threshold. And what this is doing is it's letting this guy look for more patterns in his smaller places, right? So now I'm getting back these eight clusters, which is, if you remember the original identified eight clusters, but you can take a look at this, right? These are the same eight clusters than this, but this guy has a better log likelihood than this one, right? And not only that, this does not seem very coherent if you think about it, but this guy seems much more coherent, right? So again, uh, that's why it's important for you guys to know this setting might be crucial for when working with these kinds of, of, of settings, right? So same thing for uh, maximum cluster three, uh, model search enabled again, um, maximum clusters four with model search enabled. You can see now that it identified a smaller uh, cluster over here uh, and we're using the same settings now with five with a disable, right? Again, just to illustrate to you guys the difference here with the disable, but cluster five clusters and with the threshold one, it identified the five, which was the maximum that I gave it. But on the right-hand side, you see the exact same five with one threshold one, but now search enable, right? And so you can see that what the difference between these two guys is, is definitely what, what that comes down to, right? So, and then with six and seven, uh, and then going to uh, eight and nine here. So that's, that's stretching out the limits of what you can actually visualize as well. But look at, even though I ask for nine, right? In, in my request, I ask for nine, but the expectation maximization just uh, limited that to eight, okay? And uh, even when I went to 10 right here, I went to 10, 
it still said, you know what? It's enough. Uh, A8 is the best I can do. So uh, based on all of that, right, we can do the same kind of things. We can search for uh, models using SQL now in the database, you can see that it's expectation maximization. Uh, all the models that I have created based on uh, EM, right, are there. I can check the views again for my model and I can do the same exact thing. I can take a look at the tree. And now these are the cluster IDs, right? The eight clusters that it found with the record counts um, and the example attributes, right? The sample attributes that I found originally and then I can even see things like details for cluster number two. So how, how is cluster number two formed, right? So you have a lower bin and an a upper bind boundaries, right? For arrival delay. And these guys are is forming that cluster for me and it's finding out how many people were in that little bucket that was designed and derived by, by that attribute arrival delay specifically for the cluster number two. And the same thing for the buckets. So again, that, that those counts, right? So you can see the counts here of those buckets there. Um, and finally, uh, details, right? Role details for all leaf custom, uh, clusters. So all the leaf clusters, right? Cluster number four, you have all the details for every single operator here, arrival delay less than 173 or arrival delay more than minus 193. So you see all of these information for every single um, attribute and every single uh, cluster, okay? So this is, this is gonna be a long list um, of, of attributes and the destinations, and you can see what's the weight that everyone has here for that. So finally, uh, for scoring, then again, the cool thing is because all of these models are, as, as we mentioned, staying in the database, you can score uh, via Python, Right, so I can just take a new data set of ten thousand records that th that original data set, right, the big one with all the attributes, and I can just pass it to my prediction. And I can say, you know what, and 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 keep all the columns of the original one. So now, I can uh, execute that, and and what I'm doing here is I'm just doing a group by, so I'm pulling that and doing a group by uh, a cluster ID so that I can count how many records ended up in each of these uh, clusters, right? So now I see the cluster ID there on the left and I see the count, right? So now, of course, this is much larger than my original data set, which had only 411 records, something like that. So now I can see that cluster 11 has 1,504, right? Uh, and of course, if you do the same exact thing from SQL, and I do that cluster ID. Uh, so I'm doing a select cluster ID on that model, right? Uh, against that data set. And I'll group by the cluster ID and I count, I would expect exactly the same result. And that's what I get, right? So I get the number of the cluster number here and the count, right? The same exact thing. So finally, you can get the probability as well. It's a little easier in Python just because when you do a predict probability, you get all of the probabilities uh, immediately here. So for every ID or every record, I get um, all of the probabilities, probability of being you know, cluster four, 10, 11. So you get all of the probabilities there. Uh, and on Python, I would need to uh, join right? The predict, uh, all, only the prediction as well, so that I can add that column here. So I will know what was the prediction that was um, decided by the model. And on SQL, it's easier to add the prediction and the probability. But the problem here is that every probability, I have to specify which cluster I was talking about. So in this case, I need to say the probability of that being uh, cluster 11. So then I get that probability of being cluster 11 here. But if I wanted to get all the other probabilities, uh, then I would need to uh, add one record per, per type of uh, segment here to get all of them. So anyway, 
um, so advantages and disadvantages of, of each <laughs> of each language here. But uh, but basically that's it. So I I am preparing more code uh, just to let you guys get some easier visualizations, get a, a chart on the um, log likelihood, for example, for different k on expectation maximization, and get uh, the silhouette uh, graphics, for example, as well for k-means. But um, in the meantime, uh, basically that's it that I had to show you guys today. And um, I think, Mark, we can go back to the slides if you have uh, the slide there and go back uh, and go to the questions. Sure, Marcos. Thank you for that session. That was really interesting. Okay, we had a few questions, and um, you know they've come uh, come in. And we've answered. I think one of them that was kind of interesting had to do with: Do we need to use uh, Scikit-Learn to be able to use DBSCAN clustering in OML for Pi? That's a good question. Um, so, if you're using the DBSCAN algorithm from Scikit-Learn, yes, we will need to use. Um, uh, you will need to use OML for Pi, uh, but we only need to use embedded Python, right? Uh, so that you can use a, a scikit-learn uh, app method or algorithm. Um, it is not uh, um, it is not unheard of. So so we are going to allow you to use scikit-learn inside embedded Python. Um, I would suggest uh, you guys to go to uh, Mark's uh, the OML for Pi session. Um, I think it was from January, Mark? Yeah, it was earlier uh, in the year. And yeah. yeah, that would give a good overview of that type of, uh, that functionality from OML for Pi. Yeah, and I think I think with that, you can see the OML for Pi examples for embedded Python so that you can uh, use other algorithms. Um, but, but yes, that makes sense. Um, let's see. Folks are interested in, in getting access to the notebooks. I mean, one of the uh, things that we're holding off on is uh, waiting for the release of OML for Pi, because uh, unfortunately, without the underlying software, the, the scripts by themselves, you wouldn't be able to, uh, to run those at this time. So we do plan to make those available as soon as um, OML for Pi is, uh, is released. Are there any other questions? What is the approximate date of release? Um, well, we can't give you know specific dates. I mean, what we've been saying uh, is that it is coming soon, and we are uh, nearing uh, that. Um, we have a few uh, items that we're crossing off to uh, make it uh, ready for release. So um, I would just say, stay tuned. It will be uh, uh, announced uh, in the near future. Well, with that, Marcus, I'd like to thank you again for a, a very exciting uh, session and taking us through the, the different clustering algorithms that we have available in OMO for Pi. And we'll look forward to seeing everyone at our uh, next session, uh, which will be uh, on uh, feature extraction. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank okay. you, guys. We appreciate it.